about um, our personal experiences, our professional experiences, uh, with the objective of talking in some detail about how we can change the status quo. And I'm sorry, I missed most of this morning, which I didn't intend to. So I don't know if you had an overview of the, the statistics related to the industry at large. I'm sure we're all familiar with them. So all I will say is that if you haven't seen this week's um, Women's Media Center report about the industry, all aspects of the industry, I would uh, strongly recommend that you take a look at it uh, because it, it is very granular and um, it shows shifts that are happening um, where we really need uh, to emphasize change and uh, that's what we, we hope to focus on today. So I'm going to very quickly introduce everybody that I'm delighted to finally meet in person on the panel. Um, <laughs> This is Rita Hanley Jensen, and Rita is the founder and executive and the editor in chief of Women's E News. And she has been um, leading this initiative uh, in journalism for over 30 years. She was formerly the senior writer for the National Law Journal and a columnist for the New York Times Syndicate. She's won multiple awards, including the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism's Alumni Award, the Hunter College Presidential Grant for Innovative Use of Technology in Teaching, the Alicia Patterson Fellowship, and the Lloyd P. Burns Public Service Prize. She will tell you more, obviously, about the work that she's done and why she decided to um, found Women's E! News. Tanzina Vega is in the middle, and she reports on race and ethnicity for the New York Times. She was listed as one of NPR's top news journalists of color to watch for 2014. And Alicia Stewart, at the end, is an editor at CNN.com, where she covers news through the lens of identity. Previously, she was senior producer for the In America documentary unit with Soledad O'Brien, where she helped launch the award-winning in America blog. Alicia joined CNN in 2007 as a senior editor and producer for Engage, the arm of CNN charged with identifying niche and underreported news stories. In addition, she developed network strategy and stories around black in America and Latina, Latino in America efforts and grew external relationships. Um, my personal experience is, is actually a little bit different. I, I write for a, a lot of um, different media, both mainstream, like The Guardian and CNN, um, and, and also niche media that are focused on what we think of as women's issues, or at least refer to as women's issues, um, and with a, with a critical lens towards media in general. So we would like today, I'm going to start with uh, giving everybody five minutes during which they can directly address their work, and um, specifically with, a, with an underlying theme of our trying to touch on media monopoly from all aspects, so ownership, management, and production, and content. And um, we've all discussed this I I in the past week or so, but I think we're all in agreement that the pyramid structure that we have, which uh, has a fairly rarefied, you know, sort of white male tip and a much broader base at the at the bottom um, is reflected in the way we value certain stories and the content that is produced and that's what we really like to see change. So I'm going to hand this uh, mic over to Rita now to, to start. And Thank you so much. It's, um, I, the first thing I want to say um, that Betsy Wade sends her greetings and Betsy Wade is a graduate of the class of 1955 and she was the named plaintiff in the sex discrimination lawsuit against the New York Times. She, when you talk about network, she is very much part of my network. When I was unemployed, we had breakfast three times a week when we got to, I got through it. And we both feel a deep sense of gratitude because Betsy mentored me and helped me and um, we never expected to see this day when a group of female journalists have gotten together and demanded much more and much better. So I thank you so much. And you are now all part of my network. And that's not part of my five minutes. So <laughs> um, briefly, I'm a, a battered woman. I was battered from the 18 to 24. And after that, I went on welfare with two kids 
and started college. Because I, the, the Brazilian word apertura, there was an opening in, those, in that era for people to move away from poverty and violence a lot more than there is now. I was accepted by Columbia Graduate School of Journalism and I got here. And so when I got my, my first job, I was just so grateful to have a job. And I think many of you many years later can, can still relate to that. Oh my God, they're paying me to do this and I love to do this. And I got awards. And one of the big stories I did was a woman was found dead in a kitchen in a suburb and her husband was chief of detectives of another suburb in New Jersey. So that was a suicide, right? We didn't think so. It ended up very much to be a murder. One of the clues was his service revolver was in her hand, but she had supposedly shot herself back here, and that's not how you commit suicide. So is that knowledge of how life worked, I think, guided me and that, throughout my career. And I got awards and I ended up at the National Law Journal and I was covering the business of law firms which are all run by very elite Harvard, Yale, white men. I was having a great time because I'm a great reporter and I made them miserable. <laughs> and if you ever cover, need to talk to a lawyer, all of their secretaries go home at five and they pick up the phone. So, in 1990, so I was covering, I had this Alicia Patterson Fellowship, and I was covering how the major law firms helped Charles Keating, who just died, so you may recall uh, this massive scandal, how a major law firm, two major law firms helped Charles Keating cheat thousands and thousands of people. They designed it, did the legal work for it. And I was having a great time. But at that moment in time, Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton got together and said, we're gonna change welfare as we know it. And that began a process that we're still living through. What they meant was to reduce or dramatically change the rules and regulations that governed what was then called aid to families and defended children, most people know as welfare, and I knew that had to do with women and children. White women, black women, Hispanic women, Asian women, Alaskan women. Every single story featured black people. And to this day, when somebody wants to do a story about poverty, they go to Harlem, even though now Harlem is almost all white. And I'm like, and my friend June Cross is here, she's still here, I think. We've talked in the, pa in the past and she said to me, race, I'm sorry, sexism wore the mask of race. And having been on welfare and having dealt with domestic violence, and this was all in Columbus, Ohio, I knew that that was absolutely true. I was so ashamed of the media coverage. I mean, Bill Clinton could do whatever he wanted to do. Newt Gingrich, we all know, you know, what he likes to do, unfortunately. They had a couple things in common, like how they treat women. Uh, but that was one thing. But the media collaborating in carrying forward a story that was clearly racist, a direct descendant of Daniel Moynihan, who said the trouble with black families is that they were led by women. And the, the main reporter for the New York Times went to Harvard, was a direct de intellectual descendant of, of Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and his wife worked for Bill Clinton. She was in charge of Medicare. I was deeply and profoundly ashamed that my profession carried this enormously destructive public policy forward. What was I gonna do? Well, I loved my job. 
I loved my work, but I decided in a moment of supreme egotism, I had to change journalism. So I went out as a freelancer, and I was a lousy freelancer, and I nearly starved to death. I don't know how the freelancers do it. Um, but I got lucky, and a, a women's organization hired me in 2000 to create an internet-based news service covering women's issues in the US. And I had a blank screen and a job to pay me to do this in 2000. So we were there early. And I was like, wow, how am I going to do this? But I think, in fact, I, I'm part of a movement, but it was the right moment in time. And I think Women's C News has played a role in changing the atmosphere for the coverage of women's issues after we, we left and became independent in 2002, because they couldn't afford us after 2001. We've been independent since. It's a constant challenge to raise money and resources. Whatever women's organization you go to, resources are a constant challenge. But I just want to highlight when I say, well, you know, I don't know if I need to do this anymore because Jill is already there at the New York Times, hello. The most recent Save the Children report on what's going on in Syria focused on the health of the infants. And we had a reporter who said, I want to do something about this Save the Children report. I'm like, everybody's already done it and there's no gender angle. And she goes, oh yes, there is. No other news organization covered the, what the report reported, which was the dire situation of women in Syria for basic reproductive health. And one of the quotes was, women were giving birth in doorways. That's not news. That's what, that's, that is what keeps me going. All of you saw the, the updates on LBJ, 50 years, the Great Society, poverty. No mention of the massive disinvestment in women of 96. Not one, not a little peep. Poverty is something else over there, and women's wage gap is over there. We've been covering women in poverty and economic opportunity. It's not about leaning in for most women. If you go to our website and you're very good at searching, you'll find a, uh, a chart that shows you that 97% of all secretaries and administrative assistants are female and what their wages are and the percentage of cashiers who are female and what their wages are. We're talking job segregation, so it's not just that reporter that's uh, A, gets maybe $20, $30 more a week in the beginning. It's that women are consigned to low-wage jobs, and that, as far as I've seen, has never been part of the coverage of poverty or economic opportunity or the wage gap. And when you talk about the wage gap, I rarely see that African-American women earn, what, 55 cents? for every male dollar, and I'm running out of time. I know. And maternal mortality. The, the United States has the highest rate of maternal mortality among developed nations. How is that not a story? Abortion is at last. Abortion access is connected to maternal mortality. I'm going to rest my case. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Tanzina Vega. I'm a race and ethnicity reporter for the National Desk of the New York Times. Um, I guess by way of introduction, I'm probably an atypical New York Times reporter. Um, I am a native New Yorker, for starters. Uh, I was born and raised in the Lower East Side. I grew up in public housing um, way down by the Manhattan Bridge and Brooklyn Bridge, that area known as the Lower East Side, and it looked very different then than it does now. It's just 
you can go on Facebook, I'm sure, and find photos of, um, I think there's actually a page called like Gritty Old New York. That's really what it looked like. Um, I often get asked, how did you make it to the Times despite not sort of fitting the typical, if there is a typical Times profile, I didn't go to Harvard, I didn't go to Yale, I didn't go to any of the Ivies actually. Um, I'd say it's a tiny little bit of luck, um, a ton of hard work, a ton of hustle and networking and persistence. I'm sure you've all heard this in the past, but it's really true. And I'd be happy to go deeper into that um, as we get into the panel. But just a little bit about my background. Um, I went to school when I, I had to make really tough decisions about where to go to school based on economics. Um, I got into some really good schools, couldn't afford to do it, had to make choices um, that affected those um, decisions. And so I ended up going to a state school. I'm a SUNY girl, I'm a CUNY girl for grad, um, state school, city school all the way. And yet, again, that makes me pretty atypical as a Times reporter, or at least a major media outlet reporter. Um, and somehow I ended up in the business and technology journalism world, which is not um, very representative of women or people of color in particular. Both were, were pretty, um, we're an anomaly there as well. But it gave me a wonderful training uh, ground to sort of try on a lot of different hats. I was an editor, I became, I started doing a podcast when podcasts were like, what, what what's a podcast? Um, and started writing there and worked in an industry that again, it was not very representative of women or people of color, but that gave me a huge opportunity to learn a lot of different facets of journalism, including multimedia, which is ultimately what I ended up uh, focusing on for a while. Um, I connected with the New York Times all the way at the bottom um, and uh, started as a stringer and a news clerk and worked Saturday nights and weekday, uh, weeknights, weekends, holidays, you name it, until I became a staff web producer at the Times where, again, I was offered a full-time job with benefits, which was awesome, but again, weekday, weekends, weeknights, holidays, et cetera. Um, if you get the sort of theme here, that's the hard work and hustle part of the, the equation. Um, no one can get around that, and I think that's something that is really, really important to building up um, your own professional credibility. Um, at the end of the day, that's really what I think makes you who you are, and no one can take that away from you, regardless. And so that's really, really, really important. Um, for, you know, before actually doing that, I worked for a few years in Spain, um, lived in Spain for a few years, taught ESL, went to South Korea. No one in my family, by the way, is a journalist or had ever done that before, so that was kind of, I left a lot of people, you know, scratching their heads saying, what are you doing? Um, amazing experience. I highly recommend it if you can. Again, there were not a lot of women of color traveling the world. Um, hopefully that's changing now, but that did not exist then. Um, so uh, that was an amazing part of my experience. Fast forwarding back to New York, starting at the New York Times and stringing for all sorts of breaking news stories, crime stories, you name it. Um, I was bilingual. Speaking Spanish is a big help, especially when you're reporting in certain communities. So. Um, if you're bilingual, that's a big asset. Um, use it as much as you can, perfect the language as much as you can, and, and make sure that that's a part of your uh, professional uh, repertoire. And finally, one day, um, I was given an opportunity, this is a little bit where the luck part comes in, I was given an opportunity to do a reporter tryout, like a full-time, you know, five day a week, Monday through Friday, we'll give you a shot at being a reporter. Um, and that was for the media desk. And I said, absolutely. Uh, I was a little wondering how is this going to work out, but who cares? Let's just do it. Um, something I always tell young journalists is say yes, and then you'll figure it out. But say yes when you get the opportunity. You'll, you'll make it work. Um, three years later, um, I was then promoted to being a national correspondent, which is a beat that I'm currently focusing on now, race and ethnicity. And so I was able to. I, I really, really enjoyed writing about business and technology, everything from policy in the United States, uh, privacy. Um, actually, that's how Soraya and I met was through a story that I was working on about Facebook and a Facebook campaign about um, what were considered misogynistic uh, pages and the campaign to take those pages down as they related to uh, putting pressure on advertisers. And so it was a really, really interesting um, be to be covering, and it sort of helped me lead me to the role that I'm in now, which was a beat that the Times has covered race and ethnicity on and off um, through the years, and uh, this is something that they thought we brainstormed together. We said, you know, this is something that we really need to focus on, and hopefully we're we're doing that well. If we're not, I'd be open and curious to hear your thoughts. Um, 
And that's a little bit about me and how I got to where I am. Thank you. So I do, excuse me, <clears throat> I have to apologize for my voice. I sound a lot worse than how I feel. Um, I've been doing way too much traveling this week and, and been trying to recover. And so forgive me for that, but bear with me. I too don't have a typical story um, of getting into journalism. I come from a long line of storytellers, but no formal journalists. Like there's a, a distant um, relative, not so distant, but connected through marriage. Um, Oscar Michaud, the filmmaker, you know, and that's about the kind of like formal exposure I guess I had to journalism in a very specific sense. I actually had always been interested in stories, believe it or not, um, for those who know me now, I was extraordinarily shy and um, a huge, huge reader. I just like ate up books and um, loved history and culture and was always the first person meeting, you know, the visiting a uh, student from Spain or whoever who was, you know, visiting in town. So, I mean, all of those kind of like helped shape and form how I eventually got into the field, which was, <clears throat> excuse me, I was actually had a basketball scholarship to a Division One school and um, had kind of reconciled that that's what I was going to do. Um, an aunt really was persistent in pushing me to be a part of an urban journalism at the time. It was called a HANA journalism workshop at the University of Missouri. And I went and it changed my life. It was that moment in the movie where it was like, this is before, this is after. And uh, it was really, I think, really eye-opening for a couple of reasons. But I think I had done really well academically, but this time I like, you know, my butt was kicked learning, you know, how to be a broadcast journalist, focusing on radio um, in that, that summer and really getting people to share, you know, some of the most intimate details in their life, trust you with it and being, you know, trusted to tell those stories um, quickly on deadline and in a way that is universal. And um, I felt a very specific responsibility, I think, um, just because of my own experience being um, a brown girl in the Midwest um, growing up in, in a sea of non-brown people. And also, I think just you know being a person of faith in a place where many people didn't really actively and um, uh, vocally admit that. Um, so you know, from that journalism workshop, I was really fortunate to um, have like end up like talking my way back into going to University of Missouri. I'd actually had gotten an academic scholarship there. Um, which I turned down to take this basketball scholarship. So that was very smart. <laughs> um, and it like really, I think, kind of changed the trajectory of you know, my focus and um, efforts in coming there. And when I was at the University of Missouri, Columbia, I took a history of journalism class, which was just a requisite class that you're supposed to take. Um, had an amazing professor that really challenged us to kind of think about what needed to change in journalism and how we would do it very practically. So I partnered with my um, best friend and um, who I'd met at this journalism workshop, um, who was a Nick Aguense from California. We both were like very much on the same page in terms of how to incorporate in more voices within um, the ways in which we told stories and not just um, very specific stories about those differences. And we came up with like 10 very practical ways, being the overachievers we were. We didn't just write the paper, we made the documentary, <laughs> we presented in front of the class, we were part of the test. So it really became, I think, a very active way of how can we do this? And it's not easy, but we're gonna figure it out, um, you know, with all the deadlines and all the other reasons of, of why we don't typically do it. And fast forward, I think like 10 years later, I was offered that opportunity to do that at CNN um, with, uh, with something called Engage, which was an internal website um, and partnership with the various executives around the company to work to get undercover stories on air and online. Um, in between that, I had a number of different jobs uh, you know, throughout documentaries. Um, in the documentary world, I worked within documentary production um, in radio um, and within women's media and uh, for various television and online efforts. And so by the time I came to CNN, I was able to, I always think of things in languages and our cultures and just being bicultural and being able to kind of like go between areas that really helped kind of set up um, 
having a successful uh, launch of this internal website and effort um, within a mainstream news company, which is pretty unique. Um, and you know, the only kind of model I had at the time was uh, something similar we were doing internally with getting international news onto and into prime time and um, around the the the, um, the network in terms of like highlighting those stories on domestic air. So I was really really fortunate to um, you know as you said work extraordinarily hard, but with people who gave me a shot, um, had a lot of uh, you know high level support for this effort. And I think being willing to partner with anybody um, and just hustle, 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 it really um, paid off in terms of seeing, you know, both the kind of business as well as editorial um, success of this effort. Um, from there, I transitioned into, um, you know, kind of back to my roots within the documentary world and joined the In America documentary unit, which you all may be familiar with, probably most notably for Black in America and Latino in America, but we also did documentaries around um, minors. And at that point, I kind of made a transition into a more kind of a, um, digital kind of focus. Um, like I said, I was very conscious of, of trying to learn different languages. Obviously, we know within digital, um, that's kind of the future of where we're moving. And so um, because of that documentary background, but also um, having seeing all of these audiences um, who were typically underserved, who were just doing their own blogs and getting their voice out there, even if they weren't necessarily represented in the larger sphere, um, being able to kind of connect and reach and be first in days before other outlets in terms of breaking stories um, or seeing like a Gina Six, uh, Gina Six, and how you know that was watched on our air. So we were able to take that, transition it, and use those skills in you know as a senior producer for the document, and now transitioning fully into digital in the last two years, just being a humble learner um, in, in that world and completely um, you know, learning again. So I think that if you had to kind of sum up my very um, varied career, it would be, it's all been organi organized around identity, culture, and spirit, and um, finding ways to be able to, again, be bilingual or bicultural in the ways in which that medium or media is um, experienced. So that's a bit about my story. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Um, I'm gonna jump right into the first question, um, which has to do with how we change the status quo. Um, I'm 48 and I was very intensively involved with what was then called new media in my early 20s. And um, what, we, what we see now, 20 years later, still is that despite the experiences of women like us, and despite the fact that women make up the majority of journalism st students, um, we don't make it past middle management. Either we leave and create segregated niche publications and media that proliferate hugely um, in the ways you're describing, or uh, we make personal compromises that are very gendered to make it up through organizations into leadership, where women, women of color, remain a very, very small percentage in terms of ownership, management, and um, production. And so I'd like to ask you to specifically address the dynamic between what individuals can do and what organizations that profess to really care about diversity are doing or should be doing. So I hear across all media, this recently just happened two weeks ago in Canada in, a tel in the instance of television. It happened at the BBC last year. I mean, it's a recurring theme. Why are the women not here? Where are they? And um, it doesn't matter if it's media or if it's banking or, or if it's, you know, science. It's the exact same systemic problems, um, but we seem to focus on on individual responses to those problems. So can you address that? Because just by virtue of the fact that we're here and we're a diverse panel, clearly there's change over the course of 30, 40 years. But how do we get to the next stage where that pyramid is, is broken down and we have really true diversity in, in ownership and production? Who wants to go first? I'll start, <laughs> if you can bear my voice. I think that you know this question comes up a lot and 
I think that where you have to start is what the end goal is exactly. I never, when I was doing Engage, even now, I rarely use the word diversity because it means a lot of different things to different people. And in, in a profession of specificity, um, it really doesn't cut it. Um, I, I think that when you start with a very specific end goal in terms of what you're trying to do, because there is, you know, the optics of what it looks like, and that's important, and I'm not, you know, undervaluing that, but um, there's also how and the ways in which a story is told, because there can be a difference in the optics of who's there, but the story's told in the same way just because of groupthink. So I think that there's, there's a lot of different elements that you have to keep in mind when you're talking about diversity. And you know, this is obviously a conversation that's had a lot today um, that's beyond race and ethnicity, that's also thought, et cetera. But you have to be very conscious about what is the end goal and what are we trying to do to get there? And um, that's, this, I think, the most logical starting Do you see that happening in the organizations, point. though, that you're working with? I mean, if, if, you, if, if you are involved in a major institution that professes to really be committed, mm -hmm. do you see the institution investing time and resources and people and money to doing that? I mean, you know, you just wrote an article about implicit bias, mm -hmm. and organizations will, for example, have a diversity training day which frankly, in my opinion, doesn't get them at much, instead of teaching people what stereotype threat is or how to manage microaggressions. Um, do you see those things being institutionalized as responses to produce change? I think it's very difficult to change in the way that we would like to see change happen mm -hmm. and, and at the rate and speed at which we would like to see that change happen. I think, you know, I can say so much about the times in that, you know, when Jill took over, she made it very public and very clear, not only to us, but to the outside world at the New York Times, that retention um, and recruitment of women and people of color was a priority for her. Moving people up the pipeline was also a priority for her. And we started to see that with more women being placed as senior editors at the Times. My position, I think, had you know, probably had some, something to do with that. Um, I think we're starting to see that. Is it where we want it to be? I, I absolutely, absolutely not. Um, but when you have leadership that now right. says, publicly says, this is important to the organization, that gives you a little bit of leverage to be able to say, well, now we know that you have stated this, so now here are some candidates. Right. Here are some people that we can bring it's into the It's a more welcoming pipeline. environment. It, there, it has to be, right? Because this is now something that's been stated. It's something that you, you have in your hand to say, now I have a bunch of candidates I could th toss your way that I think might you know, work for this. Mm -hmm. Now again, these are candidates who are qualified. These right. are people who, um, I always get asked, you know, can you look at my resume, can, what about this? I'm not going to pass a resume on unless it's a good resume, unless mm -hmm. it's someone who I know is going to reflect positively at the end of the day. But I do make an effort to make sure I'm passing the best resumes on. And if they happen to be people of color, that's even better. But you need to create those pipelines, right? right. So we have them at the Times. We have an institute uh, for young journalists. And anybody who is in college or in graduate school can apply to do this. And we basically have a two-week program where they fly in editors and reporters. And we spend two weeks a year with students of color that creates a pipeline for younger journalists. And that doesn't mean they're all going to end up working at the Times, but now they've got sort of the New York mm -hmm. Times stamp on them. So they can probably have a, an edge at getting an internship somewhere. Some of them may end up being interns at the Times. Some of them may end up going past that. I make it a point personally to mentor as many people as I can from that program and beyond. If someone emails me and says, can we get a coffee, I'll do it. Um, and happy to share with them my story, but that's just me. Right. You know, institutionally, I think it's a challenge when you have leadership, though, that says this is important to us. Mm -hmm. That that's, that's a, a big, big step. step. Yeah, that's huge. Um, I would like to go a little deeper. I would like everyone to read "Opt Out or Pushed Out," which is uh, one of the major pieces of research of why women leave at that middle level. And I would recall, ask everyone to read the New York Times Magazine piece about the MBA program in Harvard and why women were not succeeding and the steps they had to take to really, truly address the systematic sexism in the MBA program at Harvard. And I 
don't often like the products of Harvard, but I thought that this was an extraordinary example that it's not a workshop and it's not a pipeline, all those, all those are important, but it has to be systematic. And do the men at the New York ta Times take um, paternity leave? They do now. Do they take it it's, or they can? They take it, they, no, they take it. It's now part of our official benefits. Um, yes, no, so I know, know that they but can, but yeah. do they? They do now. Okay. Yeah. That's I can't speak for every, I, I just want to be very clear, I'm not speaking for every man or woman at the New York Times. I'm speaking for those who I know who have taken it. And okay. I know that it I is officially on the table as right. an option. I think that universally, though, we understand that there's flexibility stigma attached to men in particular, right? Men feel more work-life balance pressure than women do right now uh, because in theory, in some places, because we're one of only three nations, Papua New Guinea, and I can't remember the third one, um, that don't have parental leave policies, paid parental leave policies, um, but in theory more men can do this, however they still pay a penalty for doing it. That penalty is, um, in, it's everywhere. I mean, the New York Mets player who just decided that he would stay home with his baby was roundly and uh, criticized for doing so. Um, but in this environment, too, there's a motherhood penalty, not that everyone's going to have children, but all women pay the price for that motherhood penalty and a fatherhood bonus. And until institutions support government policies that change that, I, I think it'll be very hard for them to move women up the pipeline. You know, I, I would just add, you know, to this idea because it's, it's, um, it comes up a lot. And I think I was very, when I started Engage at CNN, very invested in seeing models that worked, not just in journalism, but writ large. Mm -hmm. um, and people have to recall, and I've and I worked with a lot of, you know, I, I often got information or feedback or blowback from various activists. And I think the one, specificity really helps. Two, the documentation of what has worked yes. and what has not and why is also really important. Um, I think that oftentimes the frustrating part of the convert, the diversity conversation, which holds so much weight and is supposed to change overnight, you know, if, if so and so just did what they were supposed to do, isn't always couched within those practical terms because of the history in which the way that race conversation or diversity conversation has been had. But I think that there are multiple ways to, to measure that. And like I said, I don't think it's merely optics or just having people there, all of that is important. Don't let me, um, you know, miscommunicate that. And also just saying the ways in which that's important. You know, one of the things we did with Engage, um, I was really conscious of, is really hearing what the frustration was of the producers, you know, of, of why they weren't doing so and so. Sometimes it's an anchor's preference, you know, of who they want to have as their guest. Totally legitimate. If you're trying to book a guest and you're trying to think of someone who might not be um, the typical, you know, meet the press, you know, guest in the past, then that's definitely a very real roadblock. Um, and so how do you work around those things that are sometimes institutional, sometimes preferences, sometimes some, you know, just uh, what it is. And so finding what the reasons are why they haven't been done in the past for that specific organization and partnering with solutions I found to be really, really helpful. And I think it's, you know, a tool that all those of you who are trying to change the status quo in whatever way you're trying to do that, um, can be effective. Do you have recommendations for how uh, people can help their organization expand their networks? Because one of the problems is that the way we have more media engagement with more plural voices is we use our networks. Mm -hmm. And um, the problem we're having is that those networks, those small world networks are still very rarefied and limited. So as people going into this field and going probably most into organizations that, that are embedded in these ways, um, are there practical solutions that you can offer for forcing the institution, in effect, to broaden those networks and have the ripple 
result? Absolutely, I would say three quick ones. One is don't look at it as an institutional way, look at it as individuals. One thing, like I said, partnering with your colleagues, whether that's producers, whether that's writers, whomever, and um, kind of talking through possible solutions or uh, giving them, like I would literally physically <laughs> give right. you know, a list of five in a way in which that it was easy for them to digest. With, for TV, it's a picture, it's a video link, it's three points about why they're amazing and what they're gonna right. add to this conversation. Um, that's one way, it's having relationships with individuals and making those suggestions actively. The second way um, is from Victoria Butson, I'll give her credit, I recently wrote a piece um, there's a feature on CNN, it's a CNN 10, Women Helping Other Women, that I would highly suggest you all read. I profiled Victoria Button, who heads the Women you know, pol Public Policy Program at Harvard, um, and one thing she says is make sure when you can't make a panel or you can't do a job, you recommend two or three other qualified great women um, who are there. I would say the same thing for your sources for a story. And thirdly, which is harder to do, but I would really, I mean, I worked hard to do this myself, you know, working crazy hours within this startup, you know, of entrepreneur uh, time, is cultivate within your schedule, like Google does, you know, the kind of 80-20 program, 20% 20 of your time to be finding new people and to be meeting with them. So for me, that was, you know, helping train sometimes, like people who weren't ready for TV, but I knew that they were amazing, and if they right. figured it out, they would be amazing. That takes years sometimes, sometimes that takes a week, it depends on the person, it depends on what you're willing to do. Sometimes it's just a matter of you just kind of like determining that you're gonna go outside of your toolbox, of who you always go to, to find someone new who can work as a policy expert that you haven't typically used. Right. I, I disagree with that. <laughs> okay. why, why do you well, like I would add to that because I think my viewpoint is that it's not about the individual people in the job, it's about the work we do. And as I went back to the Harvard example, it went way deep, way beyond just hiring uh, people of a, a certain color or gender. Uh, first of all, I think diversity is often is uh, thought of as race rather than race and women and transgenders. And so I think rather than lean in, y'all should lean together. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, a lot of the panelists have said, and I worked really hard, um, is there anybody in this room who doesn't work really hard? It's not only about working hard. Because it's like a Harvard degree. Okay, you have a hard, Harvard degree, what else? There's a lot of people with Harvard degrees. There's a lot of people who work hard. Some of it is luck. Some of it is a good employer that has a strong union. Otherwise, maybe you need to connect and bring pressure as the women like our <laughs> Lynn Paltrow did yes. this, yeah, this morning. Because it is structural. A lot of the discussion has been the playing field is neutral. You, you, yes. ha, you just make your way. You, you have the excellent credentials. You play the game. You get the phone number and you call on Sunday because you're special. My argument is yes, that's true. And all of us who made it, such as it is, are special. And, and I think, I don't like to quote Gloria Steinem either, but, <laughs> but it, it's the right to be as mediocre as a guy who gets the job, right? It's not just the extraordinary women who are here. You come from a family and no one else is a journalist and you went to SUNY and CUNY. That's an extraordinary uh, uh, biography for somebody at the New York Times. It just is. And not to acknowledge that within the New York Times and say, where do we recruit? Well, can I, can I, well, will you go ahead and then I have a question related to that for all of you. I think it's both structural and individual though. Yes, and I exactly. Think I, I agree with you that it's structural. I agree that, I, I think part of the problem is creating those networks uh, of women. Um, I think when we were looking at 30 years ago, 40 years ago in journalism, the majority of women that were working in journalism, and correct me if I'm wrong, were white women. 
So you're entering now into, an, into a different dynamic where someone, there are not just women, but then women of color. And I know women of color have largely looked at the work that Sheryl Sandberg has done with Lean In and felt, to a certain extent, identified and to a certain extent left out of that conversation. And this is actually a, a woman who's speaking at Princeton University this weekend and giving a talk on exactly that topic, on where Lean In has fallen short for women of color. Um, not to say it's fallen short in all of its advice. I mean, there are often times when I meet women, and often women of color who are either at the Times or mid-career or younger women, and I'll say to them, I'll say, well, did you ask for a meeting with so-and-so person? And they'll say, no, I, I didn't think I could. I said, well, why not? I mean, there's sort of just a basic level of, of confidence that I think women are not, particularly women of color, particularly if you add on the sort of socioeconomic layers that we're talking about, they just feel like they shouldn't even ask. They can't. They won't. Um, so I think that just letting someone know and saying, well, you do realize that's what this editor's job is, is to talk to their producers, reporters. You have every right to ask for a meeting. You have every right to negotiate your salary. Now, you're, you, you may or may not win that conversation, and then, then you'll have to make other decisions, you know, based on how those conversations go. But so, so, in, a, so, so in some areas, yes, I agree, we, sh we need to lean in. Um, in other ways, I think the conversation forgets a little bit about the specific challenges that, and it's not always, you know, I'm not always uh, conflating um, color with socioeconomic status. I think, you know, there are poor white women who also deal with another well, layer yeah. of, of socioeconomic issues that, that say, uh, a, a wealthier woman of color might not. So there are so many different ways to look at this, but I do think diversity is, should be broadened to define uh, to include socioeconomic issues, gender issues, right. all of the, the, the different things we're talking about. So I just want to make sure that I was, I was clear on that point. And, and then you had a question. Well, so, so um, we're in a journalism school. And um, journalists are supposed to be neutral and not bring their perspectives into what they're covering. And um, when we were speaking, what, what it made me think of really was the last presidential debates when Candy Crowley was given the town hall um, hostessing function and she inserted herself in a way that um, the, uh, that was considered inappropriate and um, at the same time when um, the, there was a second uh, moderator, Bob Schieffer, who went through his entire moderation on foreign policy and did not mention anything related to what would be called a woman's issue, which is tied to state security, but that was not considered an insertion of perspective. And it was not considered an insertion of perspective because he's the neutral voice in the room. And so when we're having these conversations about being immersed in these environments and both being in them and talking about them, how do you have conversations about what neutrality means? So when you and I met, it was because I had been involved in challenging Facebook. And when we were negotiating with Facebook, they kept calling the women's groups, over 100 of them, a special interest group. And I kept saying, the only special interest group I will talk about is young white men, because we are not a special interest group in this equation. And so when you're in that dynamic, when you have older editors, when you have producers, and their perspective is considered neutral and yours is not, what do you do? How do you say that? Because that is, that is the nitty gritty of the dynamic conversation that we have to be having every day to move the institutions in a different direction. Well, it's a big um, challenge. Um, it's a huge challenge. So one of the, I worked as a senior writer for the National Law Journal, covering the business of law firms. I had a great time. And one of the reasons I was envious of the female lawyers was that they were supposed to be advocates. That's what they did. So when they advocated within their law firm for whatever, part-time work, et cetera, uh, staying on the partnership track, that was a skill that was admired. And I knew that if I advocated in my, when I was working for daily newspapers for better coverage of any issue that I was concerned about, I was in danger of being labeled an advocate. 
because, and I have this new phrase, uh, bias is the default position, right? And so to overcome bias, you have to push in for some new reprogramming because it's the, the default right. is bias. And I think that that's what we all live with. And it is very dangerous for your career to be, ever be seen as an advocate. Yes. And, and, and that's not neutral. The, the failure to recognize that their value system that maternal mortality in the United States is not a newsworthy story worthy of a series right. um, is a value judgment and not neutral. Right, it is perspective. When I became the race and ethnicity reporter for the Times, I had people ask me, so you're the Hispanic affairs reporter? And I was like, no, 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 I'm writing about all races and all ethnicities. <laughs> Um, but I had done pieces on, when I was a media reporter, I had done pieces on, on Hispanic media and media portrayals. And I think it, it is a challenge, it is difficult, it depends on who your editor is. But I, oftentimes, again, I think it's about, if it's a good story, you need to push it. You need to push it and you need to convince that this is a good story outside of you and outside of anything else you write about. And I think you build that credibility by doing things that are outside of your sort of perceived bias, right? What people might say, oh, she's the Hispanic affairs reporter. No, no, no. I write about all race and ethnicity issues. Asian Americans, Arab Americans, African Americans, you name it. And that's now being proven in the track record, right? So unfortunately, that's part of the game you have to play. But if, you, if, you, if your work speaks for itself and you happen to have, be Hispanic and have a good Hispanic story, then that's a good Hispanic period. I mean, it's a story that affects X you know, tens of thousands of people in this country, and it just can't be ignored. And I think that it's a tricky terrain, it's not an easy conversation to have, but it's also about sort of knowing when to push back and having that confidence in yourself, and that's something that you build up while you have those salary negotiation conversations, while you have those meetings with the big boss. You know, you start to realize, no, it's okay for me to push back a little bit. You're not always gonna win, but it requires that forcefulness sometimes in return. Good. I think we're going to actually answer questions. Um, hi, um, my question is understanding that hustle and hard work is extremely important. Currently I'm a J school student and I also work at CNBC. And so about two weeks ago, the company had an education wide initiative. They had lots of panels. One of the panels I attended was women of the next generation. And so considering that diversity was a topic, I was a little put off by the panel keynote that is an editor at a Hearst publication that basically said, women of color shouldn't wear your hair natural, you should wear it straight, <laughs> you should wear high heels, and I'm thinking if you're giving me the job because I'm smart, I work hard, doesn't hurt that I'm black and you might need that, doesn't hurt that I'm a woman that you might need that, then why then do you expect me to walk into the newsroom and be the opposite of who I am? And so considering that you guys have gotten to a certain point in your career, what do you think about that? Because I really want to know if I'm going to still move forward, which is what my trajectory is. And so I'm a little confused. That is a really good question. <laughs> uh, the guy should be fired. Uh, <laughs> or a woman should be fired, whoever the person is. I think and there's a new word that's being used that I think is better than diversity, which is inclusion. And until that organization gets their mind wrapped around inclusion, and there's a lot of business case, uh, cases out there for inclusion, and that's where all the big law firms are and the accounting firms and the corporations are, they're on inclusion already. You need to make the decision. I, I keep sort of bringing it back to personal uh, confidence and, and personal power, and I think that's something that as women across the board, it, we grow into that. At some point, you'll realize you need to make the decision if that's the type of organization you want to work for. Right. Period. Yeah. I think that that is definitely, I have a very personal story, which I will tell you after the panel about that specific <laughs> instance. But um, I, yeah, I think that, you know, since you guys are all, most of you are students, uh, one of the things I think is important to take away from these discussions today is when you're interviewing people, they're not just interviewing them, you, you're interviewing them too. And you need to think about 
what and who, not just what you're gonna be doing, that's important, absolutely central part of the conversation, but who you're gonna be working with and how they're gonna help develop you into the person you wanna be or don't wanna be. And um, having that kind of like check in with yourself and the self-awareness to know what your values are and to know a lot of things that you can let go, which is a, you know, a daily right. negotiation is something you have to just, I mean, that you learn over time and that is important to think about. So I would just absolutely, you know, concur with what she has to say, you know, what she just said about if that's the organization you think you can work with. And, and sometimes it means, hey, you know what, I got to suck it up. I get this experience in so I can go later and have an impact in different ways. And that's a negotiation and, and it's fair and you only have to answer to yourself and your higher power and you know those who are close to you for that so you know just be thinking about that in terms of you're not just doing the job you're also representing yourself and um also who you're going to be who's investing in you and who you want to invest in it's not just the job you work with people way too long hours to you know have it just be about the work only um and i had some really amazing women who invested in me early and young and called me out and I was I mean I received it let me let me be honest like I needed to be called out and uh, that's as important I mean one of my early career like I think was the smartest thing I did was I took a lower paying job and I was making no money okay none in New York City and uh, because of the person I was gonna work with and that paid off like a lot longer than any like you know 200 bump in salary you know per week would have been i think you said something important though which is that i know when i was young um i was really what comes down i had no confidence at all and when i would interview for jobs and i had been extremely socialized to be polite and silent and we have speech norms that are status based right and women and people of color and traditionally marginalized groups because of those status differences, adapt, right? Women in particular are psychologically um, ambidextrous, for not dexterous, but, but, but we can go any way we need to, and men are not socialized that way. And so when you interview for a job like that, you really have to think, I am interviewing for myself, and it doesn't feel powerful because we are traditionally muted groups, but you have the ability to say, this is not I'm not fighting this fight here. And so I have three teenage daughters. I mean, I have 14-year-old twins and, someone, and a 16-year-old, and someone said to me, well, what do you tell them? And I said, well, the first thing I've taught them is to say, please stop interrupting me, <laughs> right? Like, repeat after me, I'm sorry, you've interrupted me five times. Are you finished, right? Because I didn't learn that until I was in my mid-30s, and then I said it constantly. Right? Yeah. And then the You're making thing, up for lost time. Yeah, I made up for lost time, right? But please stop interrupting me is a very simple thing to think about when you are having a conversation with someone who is practicing dominant speech norms, which is why we have these problems with negotiations and salaries and, you know, men from Venus and Mars, all of that stuff, yeah. right? The second thing, too, that I don't know about your experiences, but I worked in huge corporations at very senior levels, and I was usually the only woman in the room. That isolation doesn't do us any favors, right, because we know we need to get to the 40% mark before there's a tipping point. But even in that equation, I was very conscious of the fact that, you know, 85% of senior executives are men. 75% of those men have very traditional marriages with stay-at-home wives. And in those conventional, traditional marriages, um, the, the, the result in the workplace is that those men, and studies have shown this time and time again, are actively hostile to promoting women. So when I enter a new workspace and I look around and that is what I'm going to have to deal with, I don't deal with it anymore. I'm older and I have the luxury of doing that, but I didn't know that when I was younger. And I hope that there's been a sea change, which I feel personally has happened, in that women are helping women more. We understand that. That was not true 25 years ago. It was, it was really kind of cutthroat and competitive. And the, the good news is, hopefully, that that is no longer the case. I mean, in the last 10 years, I can honestly say every woman I have ever encountered in my work life has actively sought to help me. And that's, you know, that person on that panel, I would stay as far away from as possible. Mm -hmm. 
I was, can I just add one thing to that? I think that it's great. I have, and I have been definitely the beneficiary of, of amazing women who have been helpful early in my career. Um, I think that you have to be conscious that, you know, allies or mentors or sponsors come in all shapes yes, and sizes. Do. And um, you shouldn't limit yourself to thinking that it has to be a certain package for you to get things done. And that doesn't just, you know, work with yeah, people true. who are helping with you, but people you collaborate to work with. And particularly if you're talking about, you know, we're talking about marginalized communities or, you know, communities that are more muted, as you mentioned. Don't forget, like, those are strengths. Being bicultural is a strength. Like, having to code switch from yes. home <laughs> to work, that is a strength that can help you formulate yes. for that boss who may not be used to dealing with someone with you to, you know, shaping and talking about that story or that person or whatever it is that you're trying to pitch in a way that makes it matter to them as well. Um, and, and just don't underestimate and undervalue that. And I yes. think I did for a long time, and so that's why I'm making sure that you guys hear me on this, because it's really important to recognize like what your strengths are, and they're not always just because you can write. Sometimes it's just because you can listen. Right. So don't forget that. Hi, I'm Raquel. Um, I first just want to thank you all for coming and having this conversation. I mean, some of the comments that were made about class and race, I felt like you were talking directly to me because those were those are my experiences right now. Um, so thank you. Um, I identify as a Latina feminist, and I would love to write stories, uh, report on issues of gender, race, class, ethnicity, and those intersections. However, as a young broke, um, somewhat inexperienced um, journalist, uh, I, I don't have that privilege. Uh, so I, I guess what I want to know is how long did it take for you all to be able to write the stories that you wanted to write? And if you could just elaborate on that process. Well, I think I'm still working on that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the points I was going to mention is that 30 years ago, there was an understanding that every once in a while at a regular job, you could slip in, right, if you were extraordinary, you could slip in a good story. And I think uh, many times that's still the code. Um, and then, I don't know what, you, uh, if you have an employer, be clear that on weekends you can freelance. Um, and, th and that will get acknowledged. And you have media opportunities now that just never ex existed. I don't really think we understand the transformative uh, potential that we're living with every day. And um, I, I mean, I blog on the Huffington Post, and uh, people really don't like that. Uh, but my sense of it is that we give away all of this content all the time. And so what we have as an asset as writers who want to pursue advocacy, and I am a writer who is an advocate, is the ability to move audiences, right? And so if you can capture audiences in one place, you can then in effect sell that audience in another place, which is how you can migrate your ideas from non-traditional spaces into traditional spaces, which I strongly urge people to do if that's something they're interested in, because we are used to thinking in a very linear way about the metrics that we use to gauge success. And I would urge you all to think in non-linear, non-contextual ways about those metrics, because we all live outside of the bounds of those metrics, and um, we can benefit from these advantages that are not thought of as traditional advantages. And go for it. <laughs> Hi, Hi, it's wonderful to meet all of you, and I also feel like these comments are going hitting right home. Um, I hope you're not going to get upset with this question, but um, in terms of everybody leaning in versus individuals leaning in, there are times where I'm feeling um, a competitiveness or a pushback from other women that are successful. And part of me is like, you know, what, what's this about, you know? Whereas men are saying similar things and I'm getting the mute. And I understand, like, I'm inexperienced and there's a lot to learn, but when you're feeling that negativity coming from people that you want and need that support from, what, what are some of the ways to deal with that? Find your tribe, find your people. I mean, really, it's, yeah. it's not, I think, again, echoing what was said earlier, 
you can't always assume that the people that you expect to be your mentors or your leaders because they're women or because they're people of right. color or whoever, that they're going to be that. I mean, there's this sort of unfair assumption that I think we make and it's, it's not right. I mean, you have to, I've had mentors and leaders and people who have helped me out of all backgrounds, white men, yes. Black women, you name it. I mean, and, and I've done the same. I mean, the, the, I'm not only pushing through resumes that are coming from people of color. I see a talented person that happens to be a white male who, who has the credentials for the job, and I will push the resume through. It's about finding that group of people who are going to work for you. It's similar to, to your question earlier, you know, how do I deal with this place? You, you make choices, and it is, it, I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do, to find that, that tr it's, it's very hard to this day, and I, and I acknowledge that there are a lot of these issues happening in the workplace, but if that person is, is resistant to helping you, then you can't bang your head against the wall and hope that it's going to change. You have to say, okay, now, you know, I think it was in the 90s, there was that book, Who Stole My Cheese or something, and it was all about the mouse that kept trying to, you know, I, the cheese used to be here. Why is it, I, I keep coming back and there's no cheese. Well, the successful mouse said, you know what, there's no cheese, I'm gonna go to the next you know, whatever, cubby hole or whatever. And that's kind of the way you need to look at it. And it requires a certain amount of nimbleness and flexibility, but you'll find them. Mm -hmm. Right, and if by changing the status quo, the idea is to see individuals for what they are rather than the group that they yes, represent. Right. Don't expect to like every woman you work with. Yeah. You know, like, I, I'd love for that to happen. I'm, I'm an optimist, you know, I have people in here who can totally vouch for that. <laughs> um, but. That's not, it's not a real, I think that sometimes in the being pro-woman in the sense of understanding and wanting that success for, you know, people who have had similar experiences to you is definitely, I get it. Um, that doesn't mean that everybody you work with who is a woman that you're going to necessarily agree with the methods that they get their job done or their choices. And I think that that's the quicker you can um, recognize that and, and know that there's a wider way in which to get things done is definitely going to help you in whatever you're trying to do. Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh so this is just going to be our last question. Okay. Oh, there's she? a lady up here that's yeah. been waiting to. Oh, Can we okay. do, Yeah. Sorry. I'm really brave. I, I don't want you to be upset, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, did you ever ask yourself if your perception is uh, objective and how much is objective mm. uh, and to, to be to make you comfortable I want to tell you that I moved here from France two years before and I was uh, really stupefied how the people can be hers I mean black people um, uh, all ethnicities can be in this country uh, what they really are. So for me, coming from France, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to understand your feeling. Because if you were in France, um, I mean, I'm French, uh, I have French nationality, I lived where from 20 years, and I was born in Albania. So for me, it's like if you ever been there, you were really in another perception or your uh, difference. I, I don't know if I were clear. So do you, are you asking um, whether we as individuals feel as though we can be objective? No, uh, we can never be 100% right. objective. So maybe your perception is uh, a little bit transformated by your uh, culture, your background, and your feeling, it's sometimes maybe subjective. I just wanted you to, to ask yourself, in comparison with other country, and the treatment that they do to diversity. Um, Women's E! News covers a lot of international news. And the status of women in their vulnerability to violence, poverty, um, et cetera, et cetera, is a universal. And that isn't my personal perception. I'm a journalist, and I rely on the data. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I just came from France, actually, uh, which is part of the reason why you can't hear me half the time. <laughs> and um, I, what I notice and, and is that in France, specifically, and, and we can talk about this later, uh, their French kind of is more important than what the kind of hyphenated like in America. So when we talk about you know any conversation around um, changing the status quo, marginalized communities, I think it goes back to where you are and and remembering your audience and how you're explaining things. So you know those discussions of African American would just be French in France, um, and. Uh, I also know that having traveled a lot, I am much more American than I am anything else when I'm traveling outside of America. So I hear you and I understand that, but I think it goes back to what we're talking about in what we're writing. It's not only the person you're talking to, but it's also the audience who is maybe hearing their voice for the first time. I lived in Spain for many years and there um, my biculturalism, my bicultural identity was not mm. completely embraced and or understood. I was told I was an American, period. Mm. Um, that's true, but I'm a Puerto Rican woman who lives in New York who's from, so there are lots of layers to that that, that were not really embraced by the people I was living with um, or living among, should I say. And yet, within Spain, there are many bicultural people who are Catalan, they're Basque, they're what have you, and then they happen to be Spanish. And so, so it was an interesting experience. I think particularly um, talking about um, the, co the notion of post-racialism or colorblindness, which seems to be a big issue in, in France, in particular, everyone's French, and then if you want to be something else, you can, but you're all French. Um, at least my reporting most recently has shown that, particularly among young people, they reject that concept. Um, they do not want to live in a colorblind society, uh, for the most part. I haven't polled every young person in the United States, but my reporting has shown that that's a concept that is essentially rejected by young people and I think you're seeing that a lot now with the conversations that are happening on college campuses around the country. So I think depending on where you are, you know, the, the, the experience is, is different and we're, the way we're dealing with race today is, is it's very nuanced and it's, uh, it's a new conversation. Yeah, and you know, we didn't touch on this at all and we can, you know, we don't have the time really, but I think what we haven't talked about in terms of ideas like diversity is political diversity. And because of the way our technology has evolved, we've become far less able to engage in civic, <coughs> civil public discourse. Mm -hmm. And we all, all of us live in echo chambers. I mean, <coughs> our media is so fractured and niched that um, it's dangerous, I think, actually, for, <coughs> for journalism not to pay attention to, to what that is doing um, in a democracy. And, um, that was just not really part of the way we were talking or thinking about changing the status quo. So I think, I think that's it for the night. Wait, Mark, I think there's one more. Is there, oh, okay, one more. Um, so Rita, I really liked what you said about leaning in together, and I was hoping you could each give an example of a time that you banded together, maybe not just with other women, but other you know, men as well, to fight, to, to, to cause a structural change in your company. And here's the background for this question. So <laughs> I'm an employee at CNN. I'm a writer there, I cover economics. And right now we have a male colleague, Josh Lebs, who is fighting. Um, he, has a, he has a complaint with the Equal Opportunity Commission um, because our company gives 10 weeks maternity leave to a woman who either births a child or adopts a child. He's arguing that if, if this policy is available to women who do not birth a child who adopt one, and therefore, maternity leave is no longer tied to the biological process of giving birth. So why then shouldn't a man have that same right to 10 weeks paternity leave? And I've been shocked that um, within the company, a lot of women are privately cheering him on. But we haven't really had a show of force of women of CNN coming forward publicly and saying, we stand with Josh Lebs and we support his fight and we haven't had fought for this structural change within our own company. And also you haven't seen a lot of women media industry groups fight or speaking out on his behalf either. So I'm wondering, has there ever been a time where you crossed over from covering issues affecting women or minorities or other groups to fighting for a structural change in media in your own company? So I do that, that's all I do. <laughs> okay, I'm right, I'm right out here just 
I mean, you could put advocate before writer. I wrote a piece called 150 Million Josh Levs because I think every man in America should be fighting that fight personally and we should all be right there behind them, right? Um, I don't work at a company. It's much easier for me to be flexible and to advocate for the ideas that I think are important. Um, it's what this campaign that Tanzina and I met over was. It was a challenge to Facebook to change their cultural norms and recognize violence against women as hateful, misogynistic, threatening behavior. And um, that involved building a global network of advocates. And um, that's what we did. And you know, 60,000 tweets and 15 advertisers later, Facebook for the first time ever responded publicly. And I still work with Facebook every week. It's a year later, right? So I mean, my situation is very different from from your situation, um, I personally think it would be great if the women at CNN would start a grassroots movement uh, to do that. Uh, but you know, these things are difficult cultural challenges. And it also, frankly, I think the biggest issue we have with those topics is that it forces people to look at their own intimate, personal relationships, lives, distribution of labor, paid, unpaid, um, all their own relationships go under the microscope, and a lot of people don't, don't want that. Mm, I w uh, a personal experience is like the opposite of hers, which is in, in your issue, which was we had an alcoholic boss who was very dysfunctional and had the habit of leaving at 5 p.m. to go get a drink and then come back to the newsroom and nothing could move until this person okayed it. And some brave person said, we've got to confront her. We've got to tell her. And she didn't have a clue what a lousy manager she was. And that was an extraordinary moment. I think if you read Girls in the Balcony yes. and you read Lynn Poets, mm -hmm. you will know that in both cases, the women were scared to death. And somebody or two buddies took the first step to say, can we talk? And that's what it takes. Thank you all very much for joining us.